Dr. Swati Piramal, heads, teachers, and students. Good morning. Today is a very special day for all of us. Our school has reached a new milestone of a decade of excellence. Of the many schools in Mumbai, what makes our school exceptional is the innovation and passion of one person in particular. We need to thank Mrs. Ambani for this gift to all of us. Today, we are lucky to have televisions, smartphones, computers, and high-speed internet. These have all fundamentally changed our lifestyle. Innovation is what lies at the core of these inventions. The Leadership Series attempts to encapsulate this spirit of innovation. Dr. Swati Piramal is one of India's leading scientists and innovators. She is the Vice Chairperson of Piramal Enterprises, and her contributions to new medicines have touched thousands of lives. She leads a team of scientists who work on cancer, diabetes, and infectious disease research. They have over 200 international patents and 14 drugs which are clinical trials worldwide. For her outstanding work, Dr. Piramal is a recipient of the Padma Shri from the President of India, as well as the Alumni Merit Award from Harvard University, which is the highest award bestowed on alumni from Harvard. She also received the Knight of the Order of the Merit, one of France's highest honors in 2006. Dr. Piramal earned her medical degree from Mumbai University in 1980, and she received her master's degree in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1992. She is on the boards of several academic institutions, including IIT Bombay, UPenn, and Harvard. She is currently in the Dean's Advisory Board for both the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Business School. She was nominated as one of the 25 most powerful women in India for eight consecutive years, from 2003 to 2011. She was also nominated to the Hall of Fame of Most Powerful Women in Business in 2011. Dr. Piramal was also the first woman to be elected president of ASOCHA, one of India's leading industry associations. One of Dr. Piramal's popular inventions is her child-friendly perfume. She launched a range of natural fruit-based fragrances packaged in annual figurine bottles. They were offered in fra uh, flavors such as green apple, chocolate, and orange, and were completely child-friendly. The sale of each bottle sponsored one child's meals for six months in accordance with the midday meal scheme. This is an example of both innovation and philanthropy side by side. Dr. Piramal, thank you for accepting my invitation and for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. I would now like to invite Dr. Piramal on stage to speak. Good morning, Ishan, to all the teachers, uh, to Nita, my friend. Uh, she'll be here in a few minutes. Um, Today is a very special day for you. It's your 10th anniversary. Uh, I have been a small part of it uh, with my friend Nita because uh, when she first conceptualized the school, it was just a piece of paper, and she showed it to us, and I remember telling her that it's impossible to do this in one year, but she did, and, and what an amazing place it is. And I had the fortune of having two of my uh, brother's children here, and they, you know, I think it has changed their life. And I think that is the life-changing aspect of this wonderful school. So congratulations. Today I'm going to talk about leadership and innovation. And I figured that leadership, you have people like my friend Ray Kota who came last time. I thought many people will speak about that. But I wanted today especially to speak about innovation. And so in the next hour, I'm going to try to give you a little bit overview of what is real innovation. What is the definition and history of patterns? What is innovation? How do you define it? Who is the most innovative? How you can use science to save lives? How you use innovation to stand on the shoulders of great men and women? What about failure? How do you deal with that in innovation and patterns? This great fear of patterns that is pervading in our country. And I'd like to explain a little bit about that. How can you be innovative? I want to give you some examples of young innovators and then finally I want to bring it all together. 
So I'm going to use some video clips about some of the greatest innovators that humanity has ever known and try to understand some of the lessons. So in 500 BC, in the Greek city of Cyberus, what is now southern Italy, uh, they actually had the first idea of the patent. And being Italy, it is about refinement and luxury. And then, in 1624, uh, England followed the statute of monopolies. It was under King James I, who declared that patents could be granted for projects of a new invention. And during the reign of Queen Anne, lawyers of the English court developed a requirement that you must write the description of the invention. And today, even Indian law follows this statute of monopolies. One of the most innovative countries in the world, and the top in the number of patents, I think, is the US. In the United States, even in the colonial period, in 1778 and 89, several states adopted uh, patents and said Congress should have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts. In contrast, India's patent law came into being only in 1995. So perhaps we lost 200 years of an innovative economy. So what is a patent? It's a form of intellectual property. It consists of a set of exclusive rights is granted by the state to an inventor in exchange for a public disclosure of the invention. That means if I thought of a new idea in giving a public disclosure that somebody else can then build on that idea, I uh, give that patent and usually uh, the sovereign state grants that. It is not a right to practice the invention. Let's say I thought of this, it's not a right to sell them. It's a right to provide, to prevent other people from selling the same thing. And like everything else, it's a property. So imagine it's a building. Imagine it's a flat in Mumbai City. You can sell it, you can mortgage it, you can rent it, you can lease it, you can license it. So it's a very important concept to understand that a patent is a property. How do you file a patent? The procedure for granting patents varies widely between countries. And you must write down what is the invention about. It must be novelty and non-obviousness. And that the term protection is available for 20 years. So those are the definitions of that. Now what is an innovation? Innovation is to find the center of these three circles. What is desirable, what is possible, and what is viable. And so innovation is the development of developing new values. Uh, and a new system uh, that has never been thought of before. So innovation is, very used, is, is a word used very loosely. And, and I see it all the time in business. Everybody says, I'm innovative. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But what is real innovation? Innovation differs from invention. Because invention is creating the new product, but innovation is using it and using it in a novel way. Innovation is different from improvement. It is different from efficiency. Somebody says, I'm very innovative. I've developed the next internet protocol, which works in five seconds instead of 10. That's really an improvement. It's an efficiency. And that isn't an innovation. <coughs> so we have to understand correctly what it means. In society, innovation aids in comfort, convenience, and efficiency in everyday life. So you stand on the shoulders of previous innovations. So I want to give you the example of Newton. Isaac Newton was one of the world's greatest scientists. And he said, science has a great majesty and order to it. And he also talks about sh standing on the shoulders of people before him. And I think that's really the center of innovation. And so he said, you know, standing on the shoulders of great men. I think you all know this man, uh, Steve Jobs. And which company in the world do you think is the most innovative? And if every, anyone has used an Apple iPhone, you know, or an iPad, it has really changed the way uh, we function, we think in the modern day world. But was Apple the most innovative? And so if you look at the question and you think about an Apple car, and the US economy was spluttering, but really Apple was filing patent after patent. But was it still the most innovative in the whole world? And if you look at this figure, uh, which actually lists out all the patterns related to the telecom in a certain period of time. 
The number one company is Samsung. And number 31 is Apple. So you would not know it, that it is far behind actually in innovation than the best in the world. And so it is not only the quantity of patterns, but also the quality. What is the role of imagination? Imagination is not only the unique capacity to envision that which is not, but it is a foundation of all invention and innovation. And so if you look at the story of Marie Curie, there's a wonderful lady who first discovered radium and had this whole thing about power beyond your imagination. And she discovered radioactivity. And this is a story in war-torn France, when the war was really affecting people. And there she discovered the wonderful aspect of radium. So science can hold something which is beyond our imagination. And yet we have so much fear of it. In India, when we had the Patent Act, I remember the story of the giant. I, I remember telling them in Delhi about the story of the giant who killed everybody in the village. And finally, there was this prince who faced him and then killed him. And he said, what is your name? And the giant said, my name is Fear. And patents got such hold of the Indian imagination that there were TV programs that said that if we file a patent law, people will die, there will be a genocide. Well, in 1995, we did file the patents. And today, we are eight years later, nobody has died. Right? And really, the patent law has helped so much about Indian innovation. And so after the Patents Act is something that I think the Indian scientists have really come into their own. I'd like to share with you that as a board of Harvard University, uh, I got to be on the jury of young innovators. And these young kids are just about maybe a year or so older than you are. And they were allowed to present a challenge to the dean of Harvard University. And it was across disciplines. You could do anything. You could talk to somebody in another school. You could go out and hire for your business plan somebody who was really good at it. And I had so much fun being on the jury of this. And I thought I'd share with you some of their brilliant ideas. Uh, and so this is uh, Drew Faust, who's the president of Harvard University. She's the president of our board as well. And one of the 10 shortlist winners was the team Vaxess, which used silk to stabilize vaccines. Now, you know that vaccines have to be kept from 2 to 4 degrees, and it's a huge problem in a country like India. Imagine keeping it at that temperature when you go into the middle of Uttar Pradesh, or you go into Rajasthan in the desert, or you go in the Himalayan mountains. The vaccine doesn't work, and therefore you have so many, so many people suffering from the disease. And they put an idea of putting silk, like a silk uh, cloth that you make, a sari, and that they used uh, to stabilize the vaccine. There was another one which was called Zoopex, where a young team, just like you, they made cartoons of children who are suffering from asthma. They made these pets uh, go on to the, their, their computers, and they had the best person in gaming, the best person in animation, and they had the young pediatrician too. And together they made something called Zupex. And I was fascinated that this will actually become a business in the next year or so. And there was another one which was called Team Set Share. And the idea was so wonderful that you drink, you smell a perfume and you lose weight. I thought that was a real good innovation. So they were shortlisted. And then there was another one where children are looking at how, how things are taught in schools across the United States. And we take some of those ideas and put it to the 70, 80,000 primary schools that we have in each state, wouldn't it be wonderful? And that is something young people can think of. So how can you become innovative? Can you uh, think about how, um, how to apply your thinking cap on? So you go for a walk, you cultivate hunches, you write down everything, and yes, you are allowed to keep your folders messy. Uh, apologies to the teachers here. But you make mistakes, take on multiple hobbies. Don't think of one degree, try and get two. Because that really makes you more innovative. Take on, uh, follow links, uh, let others build on your ideas, borrow, recycle, reinvent. And so if you look at this mind map, it has this multiple crazy ideas inside your brain. 
And that's really how you become innovative. And the old method of innovation was what we saw Isaac Newton. He said, I'm a friend of Plato, I'm a friend of so-and-so, I stand on the shoulders of giants. But that was really the old method. And you are fortunate to live in this new century where there is a new method of innovation, an open method, which is exponential, it is networked, it is quick, it is about shared knowledge, it is about ideas going forward. Uh, you have micro-mentors instead of mentors. And you have lessons which are learned which benefits everybody. And it's the wisdom of crowds rather than the wisdom of one person. And you are fortunate to be born in this century where this kind of innovation will actually change the world. Now why are patents so revived? Why they are appreciated? And how did they actually change the landscape of the human mind? Whenever you think of innovation, you go on Google and you type innovation, the one image that you will always see is the light bulb, right? Who invented the light bulb? It was Thomas Edison. And when Thomas Edison did invent the light bulb, and when he did try to file the patents, the US Supreme Court canceled them. And so even society is beginning to worry and understand how inventions at the moment when you first invent them, they actually don't like it at all. And later on, they find that this invention really changed the world. I think this, this little clip of Edison is riveting because he invented the motion pictures and the US Supreme Court stopped. It is a situation very similar to what we are facing in India. That is what innovation is about. The idea of a dream, the idea of using a new way of thinking something different. I also, like you, was a student. I studied science and studied medicine. And I had this idea of making a difference to the quality of life by reducing the burden of daily. One day in uh, 1999, uh, I got a call from the owner of Hoxt, a research center, where I wanted to buy uh, this beautiful research lab with about 100 scientists. Within five minutes, I said yes. Because inside this lab, they had this wonderful collection of microorganisms and bacteria and plants that they had collected for 25 years. But everybody told me that Indians could not invent. They did not know how to innovate. They did not know how to file a patent. They did not know how to do a clinical trial. Actually, Indians were way behind the rest of the world, I was told, that no new invention could ever be made in India. And so I thought of this idea to strive, to seek, and not to yield and then found out ways to really look at that science. Financial Times then reported India hopes to reshape the world drug industry. They became alert to the fact that Indians could invent. The economists said the next big thing will come out of India and China. And therefore failure is important. Out of the 100 molecules that are discovered, 99 fail. Only one will succeed, if at all. And it will take 10 or 12 years to do that. So this is a tough ask. Innovation is also about failure. Because failure teaches you what does not work and you've got to try a new approach. So we built one of the best new research facilities. Many of you have been there through your science class. And then we actually mined the Antarctic Ocean, where we have the Indian base. We've found new antibiotics, millions of years old, beneath the ice where you can unlock it, you can clone it, and you can find a drug which really works on a disease like tuberculosis. And so from a domestic industry, uh, my own company became an international business. It became a research-driven healthcare company. And it was really based on science. So, so many of my inventions uh, about patents, and I've shown you the stories of Marie Curie, Newton, Edison, and where the word Bharata, Bha means radiance or light of knowledge, we are all driven by that one thing in our country, knowledge. And then to revel in it, the land where people revel in knowledge, be outward looking, invest in knowledge in a position of strength. I'd like to sh tell you a little bit about, Today we're talking. Uh, about my own patterns, uh, just for a minute before we open it up for questions. There's a screen. Uh, which we are going to launch in just a few days from now. It's called Lactocalamine Renew. And uh, the wonderful thing about it is that scientists uh, know that hyaluronic acid, which is used in all skin creams, 
it doesn't penetrate the skin. It's too big a molecule. So they kind of clipped it, one side oil loving, one side water loving. And when they varied the oil and water, it became a micelle. A micelle is a very tiny little circle which carries an aqueous molecule inside. And just to give you an idea of the size, on the size of a, a pin head, about a billion of micelles reside over there. <coughs> so using spectroscopic analysis, we made this cream. It actually attracts water, takes away hyperpigmented spots, and it improves the collagen. So it's a very good anti-wrinkle cream. Of course it is not for you, perhaps it is for your parents. But really it was something that uh, invented. It was right out here from, from India. And then we also invented, uh, and I'd like you to have a look at them, uh, they are glass fragrances. But they're not ordinary square bottles in which you stick a Barbie sticker. They are actually shaped. It's in the shape of a penguin, a shape of a duck, a shape of a dog, and they all have fruit-friendly fragrances inside. And then we got the idea that, you know, these are all about birds and animals. What can we do about insects? How can we teach conservation to children? So we invented this little band, like a toy, which you put around the, the wrist, and we added citronella to it. So it, it's a mosquito, it takes away mosquitoes. So I sent this to China to manufacture, and I bring it back to India. And uh, guess what? The Indian government doesn't recognize this as an invention, because they've never encountered it before. They said, under what category should we put it? And obviously, all new inventions are like that. They are not in any previous category. Uh, so I do have samples of it to show you, uh, and you can see it for yourself. So finally, in the last few minutes before we have question and answers, I'd like to show you uh, just a piece of music, which uh, was very inspirational for me. In 2004, President Kalam came to open my research facility. And I found by accident an anthem played by Rabindranath Tagore in 1917 for the opening of the Jagdish Bose Institute. And that time, science was nowhere. Indian science was not recognized. And so he gave this message to his friend, the inventor, the scientist, the innovator, that, come on, I hope for you victory. It was the same time that he wrote our national anthem. So you will find something a little bit similar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for being with us and taking time out of your busy schedule to, you know, enlighten us on this process of innovation. And I think there's one thing which is really stuck on my head is, and you know, it's a message for all of you sitting here that we can never, we can never fear about failures because you will fail at some point of time. Unless you fail, you do not know how to proceed further. And that's one thing. You know, there's, there's something that I also heard from our students when they're, when they're coming back from university and when I ask them that, tell me how, what else can we teach you? One of the things they're also telling is, is the same thing what I heard from you here, is the teachers how to cope with failures and how to take those failures forward to succeed with innovation. But I think innovation is something which is so important today because every university is speaking about that, and especially the ones which are, you know, which you are on and our children are going there, with, whether it's Harvard or MIT or Caltech. One of the key issues for all of these people is they want an innovative mind. And I think that is so important. So thank you so much for uh, being with us here today, taking out your time. And for all the good work that you're doing in research, uh, you know, me being a scientist, I'm really uh, interested in all this work, and I hope that we can take our children to your labs at some point in time and show them.